Okay, welcome to lecture 12 of ESC 418A. Today we're talking about peer review and specifically academic peer review. And since this is not really my area of expertise, I've invited Dr. Kyle Larson, who's also in our, in our department. Uh, Dr. Larson is an expert in structural geology, tectonics, and other earth science topics, particularly the Himalaya Tibet Karakoram system and tectonics of Southwest BC. But as part of his career, he also has served as an editor and he's served as associate editor of the Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences and a guest editor and council member for the Geoscience Frontiers Journal. So I'm really pleased to have Dr. Larson here to help you all and myself learn about how to go through the peer review process. So thanks for joining me, Kyle. Yeah, of course. Um, I thought maybe we'd just start by going through sort of the overall process of what happens when somebody submits a paper to a journal. So this is an academic journal of really any sort of earth or environmental science topic. Maybe a grad student or uh, an honor student has decided their, their topic is really interesting and they'd like to submit it. And so they'll send it to a journal and then what happens? Yeah, yeah. So the first thing that happens is, is uh, it's becoming a little bit more more streamlined now, but it was really quite complicated not too long ago where um, you had to upload all your files. And to be perfectly honest, you know, it's the last thing you think about when you're going to go publish. But it's the thing that often takes, you know, you have to set aside a whole day to make sure that your files, uh, files are uploaded and formatted correctly. You know, if you have things like tables, the tables get completely messed up as they get converted from maybe an Excel format to a PDF format. But that's kind of the first step. Um, you know, from, from the person who's uploading it perspective, the person who's submitting that journal or submitting to that journal. But from the journal's perspective, what happens then is they take all those files and um, they quality check them. They don't quality check them for science, but they make sure that the figures that you upload are visible and clear and not, um, haven't been corrupted in some weird way. They're supposed to look at those tables and make sure that they haven't been completely messed up through the conversion to the PDF. And, um, <clears throat> and once that's happened, then the actual review process can start. So it kind of amalgamates all these separate files into a one big long PDF that can be sent out to reviewers. So once that quality control is kind of had, has signed off that, okay, this, you know, this is legible, this is something that can be read and, and can be viewed, um, then it gets sent to the editor of the journal. And uh, the editor is kind of the overseer of the content in the journal from a scientific point of view. They don't deal with the formatting. They don't deal with that kind of stuff. And they typically deal with what are we going to publish in this journal? What is acceptable? What is not? And in the structure of a journal, you kind of have typically have an editor. And then below the editor, you'll have a series of associate editors. And oftentimes those associate editors are kind of subject experts. So if you have a, you know, a pretty general journal, you might have a subject expert who from a, let's say, just from an earth science perspective, somebody who's an expert on geochemistry, somebody who's an expert on rock dating, somebody who's an expert on um, sedimentology or something like that. And the chief editor who takes that paper will look at the paper, kind of look at the abstract, look at the title and say, okay, this is probably best served by this associate editor and then it gets kicked down to that next level. And it's at that level, that associate letter level, um, associate editor level, that the actual review process can start. So maybe I'll just pause there and see if there's anything that you'd like me to elaborate on before continuing. Um, no, I think that's, that's good so far. So um, at, at that point then, would the paper typically get sent back to the author for minor edits or would it get sent out for a peer review? Yeah, it, it, there's two things that can happen at the associate, associate uh, editor level. Um, most commonly the, the, the main editor, so the main editor can choose to reject the paper or they can choose to send it on to the associate editors. The associate editors also have the power then to reject the paper without going to review uh, or then send it to review. Um, so the, the chief editor, the associate editor might reject a paper if it is not um, of a quality that they're looking for to publish in that journal, or maybe it's completely the wrong field and it's not related to the type of research or the field of research that they're focusing on for that journal. And um, when you say quality, are you referring to the quality of the writing or the quality of the research or any of the above? 
all the above. Yeah. So if, if something, so the, that initial quality control is literally just, are the files readable? Can we make a single document PDF document out of that? And then from an editorial point of view, that's where they have a quick look at, at the research and okay, is the writing clear? Um, does this writing need, need some work? Are there grammatical, you know, significant grammatical errors that impede um, the ability to actually read the science? And then from, you know, kind of another point of view, is the science valid? No, or is it worthy of, in the opinion of the, of the editors, going out for peer review? Um, so, yeah. And this is kind of a bit of a gauntlet you run through. Typically, that's if you've, if, if you've worked hard on a paper, you've done your research, you've, you've, um, uh, <laughs> you've used your peers maybe to have a look at it before you send it out. Um, you can use that gauntlet is usually pretty simple to run through, but then to get it at your paper sent out for review. And then once it goes out for review, it will go to two or three. Is there a standard number of people? There's not really a standard number of people. Um, different journals will do different things. Some and uh, some journals will will change the number depending on what the reviews look like when they come back. So typically, you want at least two peer reviews. And those peer reviews, it's a kind of an interesting process. Most for most journals, those reviewers know who the authors are um, and know everything paper they have they can read everything they read you know they have access to everything that is submitted with that paper um, but the authors oftentimes don't know who the reviewers were so it's kind of a, a single blind um, I think that's what you would call it in a way, process where one person knows everything and the other person knows literally nothing unless the reviewers choose to reveal their names at the end which is something that I typically do I think if you're going to stand up and review a paper you should stand behind what you've written um, but the, it's the job of the associate editor to choose those reviewers. Oftentimes, when you submit a paper for a review, you're asked by the journal or by somebody, there's a field you fill in, it says, please suggest, you know, oftentimes it's about five names for potential people who could review this paper. And those people are, are people who are, you know, experts in a related field, um, who've studied that kind of work, whose, whose work this maybe builds off of, or who would have a vested interest in, in knowing the outcomes of the research and whether that is a, you know, they're, they want to, <laughs> to, it should be fair and equal. Whereas, you know, there might be people whose research that you're, um, that you're building off of and maybe other people's research who you might be refuting. So that it gets this kind of fair um, view from potentially both sides. And um, that isn't always, that doesn't always happen. You can also submit, sometimes there's, there's bad blood in academia where different groups have been fighting, you know, metaphorically fighting over, over research, or over results and stuff. And so you can actually also include, please do not have these people review it for these specific reasons. And so when you list the people who can, who you would suggest as reviewers or people who you would not like to have as reviewers, you have to provide just a little sampling of, you know, why, you know, you can't just throw out a name and say, oh, because he's my best bud. It actually has to be okay because they're an expert in tectonics or they understand this field area, they work in the Himalaya, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then it's the job of the associate editor to look at those suggestions. And sometimes you can pick from those suggestions if, if they actually make sense. And, or oftentimes you'll go out and you'll find um, other potential reviewers to send the paper to. And this is typically what takes a lot of the time uh, from an associate editor point of view. Um, is, is finding people who are willing to spend the time to review these papers. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a voluntary process. Nobody gets paid for being an associate editor. Nobody gets paid for being a reviewer. So it really has to be something that, uh, that you want to do or that you feel an obligation to do maybe as a member of, of, um, of the scientific community. But you're asking people to give up their time and everybody's busy. And so oftentimes it'll take a couple weeks to find enough people, kind of that two, maybe three potential reviewers to actually then go out and say, commit to reviewing a paper. <laughs> Even once you've done that, getting those reviews back, usually people have about four weeks, getting those reviews back can be a similar uh, process where sometimes people just don't review it. Other times people forget and you have to remind them and remind them and remind them to get those reviews back. Um, but you're asking about the number of reviewers. If, for example, you had two, you sent it out, you had two uh, re people review the paper who are experts in the field, they come back and one says, yes, this is fantastic. One says, no, this is horrendous. 
the associate editor might either read both reviews and then make a decision based on their own judgment, or they might send that paper out for another a kind of a almost a pseudo tiebreaker review. Somebody else who's a little bit more removed from it, who, who can provide maybe some um, different insight or different feedback. Yeah, long winded answer to that. That was a good, it was thorough, thanks. One of, one of the challenges I have uh, when I submit papers, so I work in a very niche field, I work with pit lakes, and there aren't that many people who specialize in pit lakes around the world, and the people who do, I've collaborated with numerous times. And so it's really difficult to find somebody who's either not a friend or somebody I've worked with or have some conflict of interest with. Is there any sort of guidance on how much of an expert somebody needs to be or how, you know, what is, what constitutes that conflict of interest? Say you haven't worked with somebody financially, but you've collaborated with them on a paper or, you know, like how do you manage that? Yeah, typically that isn't really a big problem from a peer review point of view. It's not looked upon as being a big issue from a funding assessment point of view, that becomes a big issue. So you really have to have people at arm's length review funding applications. So you can't have worked with them in the past five years or published anything with them in the past five years, and they can't be close personal friends. How that's assessed, I don't really know, but that, those are kind of the, the main guidelines. Um, and they're not supposed to be people who used to be your, your supervisors. So from you know, if you're going through graduate school or something like that, somebody who supervised you during your master's or your PhD, they shouldn't be reviewing your material either. So basically no one who can have a vested interest in it. Um, but from a peer review point of view, I review peer papers, uh, I wouldn't say all the time, but it's not uncommon for me to get somebody's paper to review who I've previously published with. Um, so it, it's, a, it's not the best practice necessarily, but sometimes we, we end up in that situation, even in the larger field. So, you know, studying the Himalaya, there's actually quite a small group of scientists who study and do something kind of similar and, and can properly assess um, that work in a specific context. And so what we'll end up with happening is sometimes you'll have somebody who maybe, maybe you published with, maybe you've been on grants with or whatever, who, who reviews your paper and, you know, hopefully they're, everything is all ethical and above board. And I haven't seen any evidence that any of this stuff ever isn't, but then you might also have, so they might be the kind of the, the Himalayan material subject expert, but then you might have somebody who maybe works in a different mountain belt somewhere else, but uses similar techniques. And they might be able to look at that paper from a different, different perspective. And so they provide a little bit more balance for being a little bit more neutral to, for, for your research. Um, yeah, it, it's a difficult thing because, you know, if you publish a bunch of papers, like, you know, I, I published 55 papers now, and every one of those has probably been sent out to at least five reviewers to ask if they would review it, right? So the math gets really big, really fast, and that math gets spread over a very small potential field, a very small potential pool. So I think you really start looking at things from a process point of view versus a specific target area point of view um, to add some balance to that. Okay, so once once that review has been done, I I know I've I'm I've only published about ten papers, so I don't have a huge experience here. But I have seen even in that small number, I see quite a range in responses. So sometimes you get a detailed table of uh, comments. Sometimes it's just an email with, you know, a list of reviewer one comments, a list of reviewer two comments, and sometimes you get a paper back with markups. Is is there a standard for this, or is it completely specific to the journal? It is not even specific to the journal. It, this is really up to the associate editor and even to the, the, um, to the main editor. So what, what typically happens is that the associate editor will look at those reviews, will read those reviews carefully, and, and will read the paper too. And they should have already read the paper before sending it for a review. And, and make kind of a summary assessment. So based on the, what this person said and this person said, what are the main potential issues, what are the main um, things that are that should be or need to be addressed before this uh, manuscript can be published. Uh, and uh, sometimes it, that's not the case. Sometimes nothing can be. It's just that this manuscript is not at a level that it needs to be. It's done something wrong from a scientific point of view and uh, it's, it just needs to be rejected. And so that is also the, the, um, the job of the associate editor there is to make a rec recommendation as to what happens and how they outline that recommendation, be it like you said, in a table, in an email form or whatever is, is up to that associate editor. 
Um, most commonly, it's just in an email that kind of lists out a couple points that highlighting some of the things that were common themes that the different reviews brought up. And then, as you said, kind of listing those detailed reviews um, afterwards uh, from the reviewer one, reviewer two, reviewer five, depending on, <laughs> on what, what uh, has happened during the, the review process. But yeah, it's up to the, the associate editor at that point. So you, then you can kind of have, based on those reviews, they can make decisions about, okay, well, is this paper accepted as it is? Does it, it, can it could it be accepted with minor revisions, moderate revisions, major revisions, um, reject, but encouraged to resubmit or just reject. So those are kind of the six different outcomes that you can have from, uh, from a peer review process. And all of those come with different things. So if it's uh, accept with minor revisions, maybe you have two weeks to make those revisions. Um, if it's accept with moderate or major revisions, maybe you have a month to make those revisions. Um, and it, that kind of sets up the, the response part of the peer review process. And really what that is, is when you get those revisions as an author, or those suggestions, I shouldn't say revisions, because really they're, they're, it's a review and it's one person's opinion. And so some people, when they're writing a paper, take those as being, okay, I must do this. But really what it is, is it's somebody's opinion on, on a way that you could potentially change or improve your paper. And sometimes they're fantastic. And I've had reviewers who have gone through papers and have suggested some things. It's like, wow, I, I wish I would have thought of that to begin with. They're absolutely right. You know, bang on, I'll do that. And sometimes that could be changing the way which your paper is ordered, adding a new figure, taking out a figure, all sorts of different kind of aspects to make that science clearer. Um, but oftentimes as well, probably just as often, I, I've had reviewers come back and say, you know, really, you should think about this, this, and this, and, and you read the comment and it's, and it's actually really has nothing to do with your paper at all. So there's, there's, you don't have to do everything that the reviewers say. You have the opportunity when you're submitting your revised version of your paper to go through, and this is what typically most people do, is they'll go by point by point by point and write a response to uh, what the reviewer has said. And uh, if the reviewer, you know, this is spelled wrong, please correct it. You can just say, yep, yep, corrected. If the reviewer has made a suggestion that's very useful, you point out that that's a useful suggestion. You explain what you've done to remedy that situation. And maybe you quote some text, you, you, are, you point out to the new figure that you've made, something like that. If the reviewer has suggested something that you don't agree with, then you have the opportunity to rebut that and you provide the detailed explanation as to um, why you do not agree with what the reviewer is saying and why you think maybe a different way or you're going to keep it the way that it is. So it, it's um, the reviewer, the reviewers have a lot of power, but you do have that, that opportunity to respond. It, you, if the associate editor does not straight up reject your paper, you have that opportunity to respond directly to those reviewers, which, um, which is a very useful uh, and sometimes therapeutic, <laughs> at least for me process. <laughs> so, so then you've filled out the table, you've responded either saying we've fixed this or thank, you know, thank you for the great comment or, you know, thanks for the comment, but we have done it in another way and we we're going to stand by it. So does that go back to the associate editor or does it go back to the reviewers or both? Yeah, it goes back to the associate editor and then the associate editor, associate editor at that point looks at what uh, your response looks at the change that you've made in, in the manuscript and then makes a decision. And that decision can be to accept to send it back to you for some more minor revisions based on what they have seen in, in that revised version, or they can send it back out to review. And what seems to be happening more and more lately is that those papers are being sent back out to review. And I think this is probably because associate editors are, are overworked and, uh, and it takes a lot of time to read through in detail and see what people have done. Um, and so, so those are kind of the, the three different things. And if it goes back out for review, then you kind of start that process over again. But hopefully that process is a little bit shorter and a little bit more succinct because you've already dealt with a lot of those um, potential issues. Now, are there other models of journals? I, I've looked at a few like PLOS one. I think they use a slightly different model. I mean, a lot of them are basically for-profit companies that are publishing yeah. Are are there newer models coming out that would sort of change the way the review is done and um, either make it more efficient or put different onus on people to do less volunteer work or anything like that? Or are there any changes like that coming? Uh, no. The works? 
<laughs> no, <laughs> no, not really. Not not the amount of volunteer work anyway. But um, in, in terms of opening up and and making the peer review process more open, yes, there is some stuff going on there. Um, sticking with the earth sciences field, the uh, European Geophysical Union, which is a big body that oversees a bunch of earth sciences stuff, has some of their own journals, and they've moved to at least in a, in a number of them, they've moved to an open review process wherein the paper, you know, kind of goes through the associate editor, goes out for review, but all of the comments of the reviewer are posted online and the responses of the authors are posted online and people who are not reviewers have the ability to go and actually make comments as well. Um, that I haven't actually seen that happen very often in terms of people who are not the reviewer or the authors making comments on things, because again, it's a, it's a function of time and what are you going to spend your time doing? Um, but the ability to read through the concerns of the reviewers and the responses from the authors is actually really, really useful because what you end, what you end up with with a paper in the end, if you, in, in the traditional process, all you have is, the final paper. You don't see the process in terms of how did it change going through? Was there disagreement among the reviewers in terms of some aspects of the science? That gets lost by the time the paper is published because it's just the final whatever it is. And we don't have that nuance. Whereas I find that that being able to see back into that process can be really enlightening to see, okay, well, there's actually three reviewers here. Two of them agreed. One was, was completely opposed to this certain aspect of it. And for these reasons, and maybe you agree with those reasons, maybe you don't, but I think it gives a, a um, better context for the paper and a more interesting take on kind of where that paper might sit within the current science. If that makes sense. Now, if I, if I can ask you a few things about the process before submitting, we've talked yeah. about what happens after submission, but um, in terms of getting pre-reviews from colleagues, I, I'm assuming that would be helpful to everybody. And a lot of times you'll see in, uh, in the acknowledgement section, either thank you to my anonymous, anonymous reviewers or thank you to a few people that will be named. But is there any guidance on how much pre-review should be done or... Um, anything around that process? Yeah, as, as much as is necessary and as much as people are willing to do for you, I think. Um, it really depends on the paper. Um, if I'm writing a paper where I'm the only writer, the only author on the paper, I will ask two or three people to read through it before I send it out for review. If I'm writing a paper where there's five other authors on it, I'll probably just, it'll probably just be a, uh, um, a conversation with the other co-authors on the paper itself. So <clears throat> in that case, unless, unless we were uncertain of something or we were, you know, we needed an expert in the field that wasn't already on the paper and we, we wanted some specific feedback uh, with the multi-authored paper, typically I wouldn't send it up for, for peer review, but single author. Yeah. At least two or three people will try to get to re review. And I've kind of, at this point in my career, I've kind of built a staple of, of people, a stable of people around me that will be, okay, I'll send stuff to you and you and you. And then when they have the similar situation, then I, okay, I know I have to spend my time reading your stuff. So it's a tit for tat situation. Yeah. And in theory, that would help a lot in the peer review in the formal peer review, if you've screened out some issues in advance. Absolutely. There's always something that comes up, regardless of how how good or tight you think that your paper is. Um, somebody with a different perspective always brings something out. For, I, I'm just, I just finished writing a grant application yesterday and it's, um, it's a grant application where it has to be written in a scientific language, but not for specialists in earth scientists or in, in earth science. So I sent it to um, a colleague in biology and uh, I thought it was perfect. It had been through three or four people from earth sciences and not perfect, but it was good. <laughs> it's, send it through three or four people in neurosciences, you know, dealt with all their comments. It was all good feedback. I sent it to this biologist and he said, yeah, it's very well written, blah, blah, blah. But had these very specific comments that had I not sent it to somebody who was outside of the field, I never would have picked up on and, and, and are significant in terms of changing some wording and changing the focus of some, some of the sections. So getting that feedback from your peers can be really useful, but you really have to get the feedback that is target that is similar to the target audience you're going for. So in this case, not the expert audience from a subject point of view, um, that kind of stuff. I had, if, if we hadn't gone and see, suck, seeked that out, I don't know. 
what the <laughs> past tense is there, um, it, 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 my, my, my uh, application would have suffered. So similarly, when, when you're going, when you're trying to publish a, um, a journal article, you really want to get that peer review targeted. You can get different types. You get maybe somebody who looks at the grammar and the sentence structure and the flow of the paper. And maybe you have somebody else that looks specifically at certain aspects of the science to make sure that that paper is tight in different ways. You don't just want necessarily somebody to read it just because they can and they have time, although that's often helpful anyway. <laughs> but having targets with, um, with those peer reviews is, are those early reviews um, are um, useful. And what about choosing the right journal? It can be challenging to pick. I mean, there, uh, there seems to be a lot of overlap, at least in the, in the fields I work in with the water-based environmental journals. Yeah. Um, is there, you know, kind of a, any kind of rule of thumb or guidance, or do you just kind of pick the one that you think looks like it has the right scope and readership? Yeah, I think that's the most, more, typically the most important thing is the ones with the, the scope that fits what I your work is or what you're doing in that work and the readership that you're targeting, right? If your target is, um, if, you, if, if you are writing about watershed science and your target is the general population, there's no real point in putting that in a highly scientific journal. Right. So you really want to put it where the people who you want to read it are going to find it. Um, the other things to think about are and the thing, other things that come into play, at least, you know, in the academia side of things is um, how, what is the reputation of the journal? Um, because the reputation of the journal where you publish your papers uh, has impact over how those, how those publications, how those articles that you've published are viewed. So if your article is published in a really well-respected journal, that is viewed more positively than an article that might be published in a journal of um, ill repute. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, the other thing to consider as well is different journals have different publishing models. So some journals are underneath big corporate um, umbrellas and they make money selling subscriptions uh, either to libraries to access those journal articles that you've put your time and effort into or to selling access to individual articles to individual people. Whereas other, other journals are built on uh, open access models. And while they say it is open access, really what open access means is that as a, as a, as a person who's submitting my, my article, if it is, if it goes to publication, I have to pay them $2,500 typically for a journal article. Um, so you also have to look at it from a financial point of view. Okay, well, where does this, what does it cost to publish in this journal? Do I want color figures? Sometimes journals call, um, charge more for color figures depending on what's going on. So there's all sorts of different aspects that you have to think about beyond just the simple, does this fit my target audience? Because as you said, there's all sorts of different journals with a lot of overlap and maybe they two or three fit it but maybe they have different models in terms of what it will cost you to publish there in the end and who will have access to those materials in the end as well. Now, you mentioned the word impact and that, that brings to mind the impact factor. Is that the most important metric to look at when, when trying to have the most impact or are there others? Uh, there's a lot of different ways in which people have tried to quantify the, the impact or the importance or the reputation of a journal. Uh, impact factor is the most widely spread or widely known one. Um, but yeah, but there are others. I can't, I can't think of them. I, it, it, any, you go to any journal website, it's impact factor. It's like three or four other metrics with different numbers. Uh, is that the most important thing? It really depends. No, it's not the most important thing. Um, but because because academia is so varied, there has to be, people use impact factor as kind of a, um, kind of almost like a normalization tool, even though it's not really a good normalization tool, because if you go into cancer research and you publish a paper on cancer research, the audience for that is large and the journals who um, publish that have massive impact factors because it's cancer research, it's important stuff, right? Whereas in earth sciences, you know, a good impact factor might be you know, way below what a poor impact factor is in the cancer research field. So you have to kind of normalize that impact factor for the field as well. But as, as far as is that important, it is still a metric that is used um, 
for looking at whether at, when people are assessing um, productivity from a, this person's published 10 papers, that person has published 10 papers, but this person, the impact factor of this person's journals is significantly higher than the person who, the other person who published 10 papers. So it is, it is kind of used still as a quality metric. And there's all sorts of discussions about how, about the validity of that or not, but uh, that's the system that is still dominant right now. Yeah. And is it determined by an independent body or does a journal calculate their own factor? No, they don't. It, it's determined. Who is it? it there's a whole, there, uh, there's a database that, that does it. And I can't remember. It's based on the number of site. I can't remember what it's based on, but it's something to do with the number of citations of that journal over the last year. Uh, there's some formula for it. So it's, it's not something that the journals control. It's something that is controlled by how much the work in that, in that journal is referenced. So, so it's, impact, it's done by like the, one of the indexing services or yeah, something. It's like the web of science or Thomson Reuters or some, one of those types of folks. Yeah. And how do you screen out the, uh, I think you called them journals of ill repute. I get, <laughs> I get an email at least once per day from the Journal of Water Quality Research and Technology of Canada or something like that with something that sounds just like a high quality journal, but has an extra word thrown in there to, to make yes. it unique. Uh, typically, if they're emailing you, don't publish. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably a good rule of thumb. <clears throat> um, yeah, and uh, something like Impact Factor at that point in time is probably useful to go uh, to look at. And just because it is a metric of how that science in that journal is, is, um, is accepted or is, uh, is thought of, right? If, if people are publishing in there and it's crap science, that stuff isn't going to get cited. It's not going to get um, brought into other research. And so the impact factor will languish. Um, so that is one way to, to, to sort some stuff out. If it has a really poor impact factor relative to the rest of its field, maybe be a little bit wary of it. Um, if they want you, if they want your, if they're one article short of a special issue, and if you could get them an article within a week, that's probably not a good journal to publish into. Um, if they, if they quote the title of one of your recent papers and say, this is exciting, can you put your research here? It's probably not a good, um, good journal to go with. If they, if they want to charge you to publish your stuff and it's not a reputable and, it, and it's not, a, you know, one of the one of the journals that's that's generally well named or well thought of, and you're specifically doing it because it's open access. Probably don't publish there either because they're just trying to get your money. So those ones are the kind of gray market journals. I think they're typically referred to are, are more of a pay to publish model as opposed to a merit based publishing model, uh, even though they're all kind of all pay to publish. <laughs> and there is an online guide I've looked at. It's called journalguide.com, but oh. I don't know who built that site it could have been the same owners of the journal that sends me emails once a week so i don't know it it, it looks pretty reputable um and i've yeah. tried a few journals in it but uh, it, it's so hard to tell anybody could have built it yeah I, th I think if you're at the point where you're submitting papers you should be able to be uh you should be able to assess papers as well so you know even just looking through you know a couple of recent issues and having a having a close read of some of those articles are there obvious mistakes in them is the science up to snuff um all those kind of little things i think will, will give you an idea as to whether or not it's it's reputable or not um but yeah there, there's a lot and they seem to be springing up more and more and sometimes i've gotten a couple emails from legitimate journals that look all for the world like those gray market journals sending me emails so i was like whoa <laughs> you guys need to change your marketing a little bit because it's getting you know, it's the, we're kind of crossing over here but uh anyway Okay, uh, maybe one last topic, um, if I can get your opinion on just sort of the costs and benefits of publishing. And this is, you know, intended for, you know, our, it's a fourth year university class. So people might be doing an honors thesis or thinking about grad research or going off in into the field of becoming a professional scientist and might have interesting work to publish. Can you talk just a bit about the costs and benefits? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think of it from that perspective. Uh, if you were thinking that you might want to go on in further in academia or, or, you know, get an advanced degree and then move into the, move into industry. Um, I, and you have something that you think might be useful to publish. I think it's a, I think, I think the act of trying to get something through and published 
is very eye-opening from, from uh, kind of the whole perspective in terms of what goes into a paper. So this time in fourth year, you probably read a bunch of different papers, but the actual amount of work that goes into producing something that then gets published is, is pretty staggering. Uh, it, it is not something that is just simply done and, and, you know, it just happens and you write a paper on a weekend. It's something that is months uh, in, in, the, in the process oftentimes. Um, but I, I think that process, that, that being able to start something, a research project, put it into a very specific, um, order it in a way that is sensical and, and, and lay out your findings also in a way that is sensical is a super useful endeavor that if you're not necessarily targeting publishing, maybe you wouldn't do in as earnest a way. Um, so I think there's a lot of value in just going through that process in learning how to write and organize a research project, whether or not you're going to go on and do anything further with, even if you're not going to publish again or something like that. I think that you, typically I, have, I joke with my kids about it, right? And they're, what are you doing? I'm going down to read. I'm going down to write. And basically my day is spent as a writer. And I never would have thought that in my fourth year of, of university. <laughs> um, but that's basically all I do now. Um, so I think any more experience you get with writing in a technical aspect and for a specific audience will, nothing, will do nothing but benefit you down the road. Um, from a, from a, if you are going to go into academia, building that CV of published works is super important as well, because a lot of the decisions that go along with accepting students and or funding related to students, you have to have some evidence of research excellence. And if you were able to pull a, a publication out of an undergrad thesis or something like that, or some sort of directed study that you might be doing, that goes a long way to showing that, uh, that you are capable of, of conducting and finishing research. The finishing aspect is, is pretty key. A lot of people start stuff, um, mm -hmm. but if you can finish it and see it through to fruition, that does also, um, also looks good on your CV. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if there's, if there's that, anything that, else. That's helpful. I mean, I, I would agree with that, even coming from a non-academic background, uh, where having publications on your resume is not as important. It certainly is nice to have, but the big benefit that I see is exactly what you said, helping you become a better writer, going through that process, putting in the work to help really clarify your thoughts and to go through that process of uh, laying it out and having it reviewed and yeah. having it, I don't know if perfected is the right word, but certainly vastly improved. And it, it can be a bit humbling actually to get back a big review of, work that you thought was great and ready for the press. And, you know, you've got back a lot of comments that you've still got some work to do, but you sure learn a lot going through that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a pressure cooker for, for improving your writing and improving your science every time, because every paper is different yeah, and it gets reviewed oftentimes by different people. You get those different perspectives and, and you learn real quick when somebody brings up a very valid point about something that, that maybe you've done or the way that you've written something. It's like, oh, yep. And I remember those <laughs> the next time I'm writing, uh, guaranteed. Okay. Well, that, that is lots. That was a great walk through the peer review and publishing process. I really appreciate it. That was super insightful for me. And I'm sure the fourth year students will learn a lot and hopefully we've convinced them that it's a good process to go through. <laughs> yeah, it's not painful at all. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely worth it. Yeah, I think so too. Cool. Okay, well, thanks. Yeah, no worries at all. Have a great day.